Praise the living God. And be reminded of this while I'm preaching. Jesus Christ could come in the clouds of glory and receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. I fully expected the Lord to come this week. I lived like it. I prayed like it. I acted like it. He didn't, but he might come today. And if he doesn't, I'm still going to live like it, pray like it, act like it. He's coming soon. Amen. Very quickly, I want us to go to Acts chapter 19. And I want you to read with me verses 1 through 7. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, of course, we're having a great prayer meeting. I'll look to see you there. Things change when people pray. In fact, everything changes when people pray. And you've heard me say it time and time again. Every time you pray, something happens. Every single time, something happens. So we'll begin with verse number one and see what the Lord has in store for us today. Would you read it with great enthusiasm? This is the word of God that endures forever. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. Amen? Amen. Thank you for being seated. <clears throat> I'll wait till you get settled. This is not the first time you've ever read this. It is not the first time I've ever had you read it with me. What I want you to notice again is that Paul was not asking them if they were saved. They were already saved. If he were asking them that, he would be asking, did you get saved when you believed? <laughs> that makes no sense. What he's asking is, since you believed, since you were saved, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they replied, we're not really familiar with that. It didn't mean they'd never heard of the Holy Ghost. It meant that in their travels, they had not heard that there was a Pentecost and that Pentecost had been poured out. And hundreds of people were filled with the Spirit and they spoke with tongues and now they're preaching the Word everywhere. They were not familiar with that scenario. So when he explained to them that Jesus has ascended to heaven, and he poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit on those people and that it is available for everyone who calls on his name. They said, we'd like to be baptized, and he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So you have believers who have not yet received the Spirit. <clears throat> you have an apostle who lays his hands on them, and when he does, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Yes, yes, they were believers, but they had not received the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they spoke with tongues and preached. 
So I repeat what I said Monday night. Salvation is the Spirit baptizing you into Christ. The filling of the Spirit is Christ baptizing you into the Spirit. And yes, it is possible and it is factual that many believers do not yet have the Spirit. Oh, you can't get saved unless you have the Spirit. <clears throat> if you are saved, it was because the Spirit has made a new creation out of you. But there is something that Christ offers that gives you power to live right and overcome the flesh and ward off the attacks of the enemy. There is a boldness that comes greater than the boldness you have when you know you belong to Jesus Christ. Sandra told me yesterday she read something. I thought it was absolutely marvelous. And in this thing she read, it said, there are no civilian Christians. Everybody is a soldier. I said there are no civilian Christians. You don't just sit and watch everybody else fight the good fight. You don't sit on the pew and say, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> you are either a prepared soldier or an unprepared soldier. <clears throat> there is a battle, and you're going to have to face it. You're going to have to face it either unprepared or prepared. And Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to prepare you with power when you are provoked and antagonized and assaulted by the evil one. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So all my life I have believed that there is a Holy Ghost baptism and that it is an endowment for power. It is not salvation, it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And for those who are still wondering, and I know you are, we have many who come from one of those denominations that literally taught that it was demonic or not for today. Just listen to the reason of the scripture. Listen to me as I, I logically point you to the word of God. If you take the baptism of Jesus Christ, his cousin John, go with me to the Jordan River. His cousin John is down in the Jordan River baptizing left and right, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And his cousin Jesus shows up in the crowd and walks down in the water. And John said, I'm the one that needs to be baptized by you. And Jesus was saying, well, you baptize with water right now. Let's do this. But there's coming a day when I'm going to baptize people with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize with fire and power. And so when cousin John took him down in the water and brought him up, the Bible says the heavens departed and the Holy Spirit came upon him. Hallelujah. Could anyone doubt that Jesus was the Son of God before he walked down into the Jordan? Not one person anywhere would deny that Jesus was the Son of God. He was born of the Spirit. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. His heavenly Father uh, was the one that sent the Holy Spirit into the womb of Mary, and she conceived and she brought forth, and he is the Son of God, the Son of Man without sin. He was a son, but even the Father knew that his Son, who was born of the Virgin, needed a power needed a power to come upon him because he was about to walk into a test like no other man has been tested. And he would live for three years like no other man would live. And he would face things that no other man would face. So the father said, I got something to help my son get through this situation. So when his son came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down in the likeness of a dove, sat upon Jesus, and the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Watch this. And that same spirit led him to the wilderness. I believe I preached on that last week. After a deliverance, you always go to the wilderness. After an encounter with God, you always go to the wilderness. And the Bible says when Jesus 
was filled with the Spirit. He was led by the, by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil to be tested. You know why that story is there? Why this truth is, is imminent before us? Because even a Christian without the baptism of the Holy Ghost might yield to the offers of Satan. Did you hear me? Even a child of God can listen to and yield to the temptations and offers of Satan without the power of the Spirit to give him that inner strength to say, no, I'd rather have Jesus. And I'll say it again. It is a fact. I have seen it. There are plenty of children of God, Christians, born-again ones, who are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Such was the case right there in the book of Acts. They were believers. They were disciples. It says that. But when Paul came up, he said, since you believed, have you received the Holy Spirit? And you know the rest of the story. So when I look at Jesus again in the Jordan, and I'm talking about the sinless Son of God, not one thing in Him that would displease the Father. And yet the Father said, you're going to have to have an endowment. I'm going to send the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the same one that conceived you in Mary's womb, to now light upon you and fill you up. That's why Peter could preach to the house of Cornelius in Acts 10, 38, how Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and delivering all those who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. It says over and over again, Jesus was anointed with the Spirit. It says Jesus was filled with the Spirit. And so when the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days without food or water, Satan did his utmost. All that evil can do, Satan brought it to the table. The lust of the flesh. I fight it every day, like you. The lust of the eyes. There's another battle every day, like you. The pride of life. Oh, it's sneaky. But you have to wrestle with it every day. And so the sinless Son of God, now empowered with the Holy Spirit, finds himself weakened without food and water. And he's, he's in the presence and under the, under the influence of this dark, sinister devil that wants to destroy him before the time. And so Satan comes to Jesus and says, I know you're hungry. It's natural to feel these urges. There's nothing wrong with your urges. You are the Son of God. You can do anything. Make bread for yourself. Nobody else is here. Take your power and use it for yourself. Turn the blessing of your Father in on yourself. It doesn't matter. God understands. But Jesus said, listen, devil, my life is not about my belly. It's not about my lips or my loins. My life is not about satisfying my urges. It's not about making myself happy. My life is about serving my God with all that I have and all that I am. And I have to say no to the urges of the flesh if I want to be filled with the Spirit all the days of my life. Satan comes again and says, go to the temple, the pinnacle of the temple, the highest place on the temple. Jump down. God loves you so much, he's not going to let you... Let you allow you to get hurt, dash your foot against a stone. Make God do something for you. Make God prove himself to you. Oh, isn't that what 
Christians wrestle with all the time? Show me God. Prove to be God. That's why illiterate, biblically illiterate Christians talk about putting out a fleece. You don't put out a fleece as a child of God and say, God, if you want me to do this, do that. He doesn't respond to anything but faith-filled obedience. Don't you ever again put out a fleece. It means absolutely nothing except that you have no faith in the faithfulness of God. Jump down. Prove God. Make him show up. He doesn't seem to realize you're here in this condition. Do something that would warrant God to move quickly, to emerge from the shadows and prove to you that he is God. And here's what Jesus said in essence. No, thank you. It is written. God does not have to prove himself to me. God doesn't have to do this by a certain time. God doesn't have to make me understand or make me believe. God just expects me to expect him to do what he said he would do and be who he says he is. He is God, and I use this term again, he's a faithful God. He is not, he's not even an on-time God. I hear that a lot. He's an on-time God. God doesn't know time. He knows faithfulness. Only people conscious of time talk about an on time God. He got here when I thought he would. He got here when he needed to. No, he got there in his faithfulness to glorify his own name and he expects you to praise him when he doesn't seem to be an on time God. Prove God? When will you get to the place that God doesn't have to prove himself to you? When will you get to the place that every time you, you run into, I just thought of something someone said to me Friday night. We were sitting there talking and one of those thunderstorms popped up. We've had some violent thunderstorms, haven't we? And I looked on the map. I got, you know, weather bug and punched it on my phone. And the whole eastern part of the United States was dotted with yellow little thunderstorms popping up everywhere. So you don't know when one's going to pop up in your life. It could be a vi one of those violent ones today before you get in the bed tonight. But they pop up all the time. And it seems like the closer we get to the coming of the Lord and the more we seek the Lord, the more the little thunderstorms of life pop up and they can tear you up and they can blow things away and they can blow things down and they can drown stuff out. And if you're not filled with the Spirit, you'll be wondering, why does God allow this? Lord, show me, show me that you're faithful in all of my storms. Folks, there, will, there ought to be a day when you are filled with the Spirit and no matter what pops up or when it pops up or what it destroys or what it brings, you can say, I will bless the Lord at all times. So Satan comes again and he says, look, this one you can't refuse. Now remember, Satan is the God of this world. God Almighty has allowed him for a time to be the God of this world and the God of this age and he's able to blind the eyes of people so that they cannot see or believe. He is the God of this world in that he, he controls government, human government. He controls the entertainment industry. He controls the banking industry. He controls the military he controls everything, you see. He's the God of this world. And the God of this world came to the Spirit-filled Son of God and said, look, let me show you something. And in a moment of time, in a vision, Satan showed Jesus every kingdom and its glory. Wealth, power, dominion, recognition, beyond anything we can imagine, all great kingdoms, all wealth, all everything piled up and laid at the feet of Jesus 
And Satan said, if you will bow down and worship me, just get on one knee for one second. That's all I ask. I'm not asking you to lay prostrate. I'm asking you for one second to acknowledge me. Just let the spirit world know that you know who I am. And in the words of Lorand, through the scriptures, Jesus said, everything you're offering me is temporary. The Bible says thou shalt worship the Lord God and him only shalt thou serve. Satan, the smell of this offer is sickening. I've already come down to this pig sty called earth and I've got to put up with the odor of your presence and your spirit and now you offer me a trash pile? You offer me everything I made to start with? You want to give me back what I built with my own mouth? You think that's a deal? Well, let me tell you something, Satan. There's not enough money. There's not enough power. There's not enough glory for me to take my eyes off my father and look in any other direction except the glory of heaven. Amen. And Satan left, and the angels came and ministered unto Jesus. He fought and he won because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to teeter, not teeter. I, I, maybe I will use the word teeter just a bit and tell you that I don't believe Jesus could have passed those tests without having received the Father's gift of the Holy Spirit. If he did not need it, the Father would not have sent it. He needed it. And he needed just exactly what the Father sent. So when Satan left until a more convenient time, Jesus got up, oh my, my, and walked down into a village and walked into a meeting and opened up the Bible and said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to open the sight of the blind, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You see, when you've got the Holy Spirit, you can go through any test. You can put up with any devil. You can handle any thunderstorm. And when you come out of it, you'll say, God's Spirit's all over me, and I can do whatever he's called me to do. You see, we have lots of Christians who haven't passed that test and their God is their belly, their senses, their urges and desires. They just cannot fight them and have victory over them. There are Christians not filled with the Spirit who constantly talk to God in such faithlessness. Where are you, God? Why won't you show up, God? Prove to me that you love me, God. There are plenty of Christians not filled with the Spirit who settle for fool's gold and fame and popularity and always struggle between this world and that world. They never really get victory. They don't know what it is to walk in purity and power and joy because they're always strung out between the flesh and the spirit, heaven and earth, God and Satan himself. I'm trying not to get out of shape here this morning, but this thing's burning inside of me. You see, here's, here's what defines a true Christian. And Paul said it in Philippians. We are the circumcision, meaning the true Jew. We are the believers who worship God in the spirit. He did not say who worship God go to church, read a liturgy, go through some scriptures, listen to a speech, and sit there and watch their watches and then hope it's over and then say, I got to do this again next week, but at least I went to church. No, he said a true Christian worships God in the spirit 
Meaning, it's not from your mouth, it's not from your head, but it comes from the belly of your soul, from your heart, and you just can't hold your peace. You can't hold it back. At some point, you've got to say, I bless you, I praise you, you're worthy, you're God Almighty in my life. And all the time people say to me, well, you know, it's not my nature to do that. That's the problem. You need a new nature in your life. You get the nature of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will do some talking through you. Worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? You worship God in the Spirit. You get happy about Jesus. He's not a religious figure. He's your Savior. He's the Son of God. He's your deliverer. He's your provider. You rejoice in Jesus Christ. And you have no confidence in the flesh. You're not proud of anything you've ever done. It's all nothing. But he did it all for you. And he gave it all to you. Hallelujah. Now, you say, but pastor, Christians, how can they... Give in to the flesh. And what do you mean about being filled with the Spirit? If a, if a man's a Christian, isn't he a Christian? No. Paul writes and says, For many walk, in Paul's writings, a walk is a lifestyle. For many walk or profess Christ or claim Christianity, whom I have told you often, and tell you now, even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, we don't want to deal with this. We want to say, I can't judge. We should let people grow in their own way. But Paul said, there are people who profess Christianity and know nothing about the power of Jesus. They're not even saved. Oh, could that be somebody in here today? I'm a Christian. What fruit do you have to prove it? I'm a Christian. Where is the evidence of the faith? For many walk, he said. Many profess Christ. And I have told you often, and right now while I'm telling you again in this letter, I am weeping because they are truly the enemies of of the cross of Christ. And he said, I'll tell you this, their end is destruction. They're not on their way to heaven. They talk about it, but they're not going there. Whose God is their belly. There it is again. It means they live by their desires, their urges all the time. That's all they know. Who glory in their shame. That means they're not ashamed of sinful things. They don't blush at anything whether they watch somebody do it or whether they do it themselves. They glory in their own shame and they mind earthly things. Their mind is on this earth. But our citizenship is in heaven from which we look for the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change this vile body that it may be changed into a glorious body like his by the resurrection power of Jesus. You see, you know you're not a Christian if all you think about is this world. If there's not a longing, a hunger, something gnawing at you to go to heaven. Does that sound too old-fashioned? It ain't. It's the truth. If you don't think about heaven often, if you don't rejoice in leaving this world frequently, if you're not obsessed with Jesus totally, you may just be one of those professing Christians and when the day comes and the rapture takes place and God's people are gone and you're left behind, you'll know then. That's why, oh God, if you knew what's burning inside of me right now, church, you would really be proud of me because I'm able to contain myself right now. Listen to me and let me ask you a question. It seems like I'm vacillating a little bit here between being saved and being spirit-filled. Who cares? Sir, ma'am, whoever's watching me on that camera, 
Who told you that you could sin and still go to heaven? What books have you been reading? Amen. What teacher have you fallen in love with that tells you that God loves you so much? He's willing to ignore your sin to get you to heaven. Do you really think that you can sow to the flesh and not reap corruption? Where did you read? Where? Not, it wasn't here. But so, so whose book did you read that told you you could get drunk and go to heaven? Or that you could fornicate and God would still love you? and take you to heaven or commit adultery. Who told you that you could live a homosexual lifestyle because God loves everybody just the way he made them and he made you that way? Who told you you could live this kind of life and still please God? Oh, and that's pastor preaching. No? Uh, Stephen, throw up there 1 Corinthians chapter 6 for me if you would, please. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Everybody else, read those next words. Do not be deceived. That wasn't good enough for me. Say those words. Do not be deceived. You better hear me. We're in the last days. And one of the signs of the last days that many people will heap unto this, themselves teachers having itching ears and they will turn their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. Do not be deceived. Don't let, let anybody trick you. Don't let any teacher, don't let any professor of religion trick you into anything except what God's Word says. What does it say? Next verse. Neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. There you have it. I didn't say it. God said it. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you reap to the flesh, you will reap, or sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Thus saith the Lord. Well, that ain't me. I don't do any of those things. I'm out of the woods there. I'm safe. I'm good. Uh, are you? Are you? I'm spirit-filled, Pastor. I know I'm saved and I'm spirit-filled. Are you? Really? Who told you you could be filled with the Spirit and live in anger? Anger. Did you know you don't have permission to be angry but just a little short time and then get it out of your system? Did you know you don't have the right to be angry about racial things or political things. You don't have the right to be angry about something that happened in your family. They did you wrong. You don't have the right to be angry because you were born with some type of uh, uh, shortcoming, or handicap, some type of injustice was served to you. Did you know you can't be filled with the Spirit and complain? Church, do you hear me when I tell you if, if there's one thing that insults God, if, it, if there's one thing that makes Him want to rain fire down on His people, it's when they complain. Because in essence they're saying, I don't like the way you're doing this. I don't like where you've put me. I don't like the people you put around me. I just don't like the life you've given me. You cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and go around complaining all the time about everything and be upset about everything and agitated and sensitive and explosive. 
about issues and everything that comes in your life. You can't be filled with the Spirit and exercise no control over your tongue or your temper or over your body, your whole body. Because when the Holy Ghost comes in, I said Holy Ghost. Sometimes I want to say Holy Ghost. Some of you are more familiar with Holy Spirit. I say that too, but sometimes I want to say Holy Ghost. When the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost comes into you, brother, there will be love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, and self-control. You know you are filled with the Spirit, not just because you speak in tongues, but because you can forgive your neighbor. You can say, I'm sorry, when you know they were wrong. It's when you can turn the other cheek. It's when you can forget what they did to you. And you realize, this is the life God gave me. And he gave it to me because he loves me. And I'm going to give it back to him with everything I have and everything I, I ever hoped to be. I guess... I guess people would prefer that I speak smoothly and softly, that I inspire you, lift you up. You've had a hard week. Who hasn't? Pastor, you mean I got dressed after the hell I've been through this week? I got dressed and now I'm sitting here letting you tongue lash me? Yeah. That's exactly what you did today. It might be my tongue, but it's his word. Amen. Hallelujah. And I would ask you, I would ask you, what am I supposed to do? I stand here in this pulpit, and I, I see thousands of people every Sunday and interact every day of the week or hear things from staff members every day of the week. What am I supposed to do when I've got people sitting on these pews who are lost, and if Jesus were to come today, they'd be left behind, who are lost, and if they would drop dead from a heart attack, they'd go straight to a devil's hell. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to coddle and, and, and stroke and Say, you know, everything's good and Jesus loves us and boy, he's going to get you out of this and he's going to give you more money than you've ever had and you're going to get a bigger home than you've ever had. Yeah, just hang in there, buddy. Oh, God's good God. He understands you. Am I supposed to do that? There's not one prophet in the Bible, not one apostle, including the Son of God, that ever stood up and spoke smooth easy, entertaining words, every single one of them said, God is looking for more than you're giving him. God is not happy with the life you've chosen. And even if you're one of his children, he's saying, draw closer to God. Lay aside this world. Put off the old man and put on the new man, which is renewed in the image and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So am I supposed to just stand here and say something hoping you'll come back next week? God forbid! I will not do it. I will stand here like the man of God he told me I was. I will stand here under the fire blistering over my head and the fire shut up in my bones. And I will say to you what Jesus said to his generation, save yourselves, save yourselves, save yourselves from this ungodly generation. Pick up my cross, follow me daily. Say no to the world, no to the devil. Get with me, walk with me, trust me, talk to me, live in me every day of your life. And up. I wrote it down. Here it is. This question I'm supposed to ask you. 
When? When are you going to get down to business with God? Stop playing these games. When will you be desperate enough to walk away from that old crowd that keeps you in trouble? And serious enough to put the, put the mug down. Walk away from that life. When? I think I've, I'm going to explode any moment. When will you get serious with God about eternity? Because as surely as I'm standing here, the trumpet is going to sound. In, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and you will not have a chance to get it right with God. There are no second chances. So I'm, I'm talking to two groups of people here. Those who profess that they know Him, but in works they deny Him. Today is the day of salvation. Now here's the thing. I'm not going to try to dignify this at all. Years ago, when a message was preached like this, the preacher wouldn't even get to finish. People would be running to the altars and crying out for the mercy of God to be extended to them. But these are the last days. And people go, ah, I'm working on it. I got plenty of time. They're not really convicted of the Holy Spirit. This is your time if you don't know Christ. If you're walking in the flesh, this would be a great day to work it out so that Christ can say He's mine. You can come anytime I'm talking. This is not a formal program. And then I would say to those other people, why would you not avail yourself of the power of the Holy Spirit? The, the battles that are coming will require more more of the power of God than you can possibly imagine. The offers from the world, the tricks of the devil are going to require that you have a supernatural ability that only comes from heaven. Why wouldn't you grab it, take advantage of it today? Here it is. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed nobody's here. This ain't my church. I'm just the messenger. I'm the mailman. So this is your time. My reputation is not up for grabs. This is your time. What will you do with the word of the Lord? Here you go. Call unto me. I will answer you. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast away. Come close to me, he said. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Would anybody want to come pray with anybody down here? Just just touch them on the shoulder and let, you, let them know you're there. That's all. Let them and God work it out. There you go. This is not fair. It's not, this silence is not fair to these people down here whose hearts are screaming out to God. For us to stand here like we've just been to a Broadway show is ridiculous. There's a man crying out to God. Here's a young woman shedding tears, running down her face. Here's a man wringing his hands. I, I think I can help them. I think I can ask God to come in mighty power and waves of glory 
and do a thing in them that will never be undone. Yes, Jesus. Take it all, Jesus. I give it all up, Jesus. I'd rather have you, Jesus. I've tried everything else, and I'm still empty, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, do that mighty work of salvation and cause those to hunger for the infilling of the blessed Holy Spirit. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Look what the Lord is doing here. Look what the Lord is doing here. Ole my shahabateka say. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, save her to the utmost. Wash them and cleanse them. Sanctify them by your word and by your spirit, Lord. Let everyone in here, Lord, get down to business with you. May we realize that these are desperate times and we need a double portion. Hallelujah. I wonder if I could get somebody somewhere to help me sing what David is playing today. If you're saved and you happen to be happy about it, could I get somebody to act like you're on your way to heaven? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. so full this morning. I, I think it's, it's unfair for me to feel this good. And some of y'all look so sad and so impatient right now. Can I get me about 50 spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-filled people to come up here and stand in front of this altar with me? Could I get me some praisers? Can I get a brother or a sister? Can I get a fellow soldier who's prepared to come down here and, and help this preacher Praise a God who is worthy of all praise. Can I get some warriors to battle the Lord's enemy? Pray in the Spirit. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I bless you, Jesus. I thank you for saving me, Jesus. I thank you for filling me with the Holy Ghost. I praise you for the fire, the fire that burns. I praise you, God, for the almighty grace and goodness. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Hey, 
Let's send another surge toward heaven. Send another wave of praise toward heaven right now. We bless you, Jesus. Yes, oh, Moses. Hallelujah. All right, take a deep breath. Let's get ready for a third wave right here. To him who sits on the throne, we bless you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm ready to go again. Will you help me, James? Yes, Number four, let's send another praise up to glory. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to do it again. I'll tell you why. See, I'm up here right now, and I am pumped. I'm soaring. When y'all leave, I'll crash. Then I got to get back up again for the next service. So I'm going to get all the juice out of this one right here. Number five. I bless you, Jesus. Glory to your name forever and ever and ever. We bless your name, Jesus. There is none like you, Lord. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come forever and ever. You are worthy. Go sing it now, choir. We sing to you, Jesus. pray tomorrow night at 7. I'll leave you with this question and let you and the good Lord chew on it together. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now take it on with you. Ask God in faith because Jesus said, my Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. Maybe it's not for me, preacher. That's not what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. For the promise is unto you, your children, to all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's everybody. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Amen. If he doesn't come, I'll see you tomorrow night.